think that strength of a shell also is is uh, enough to sustain life through to be able to you know, pull in oxygen and um, you know to therefore have uh, a you know, young bird in here is, is so amazing at the same time that is also our issue because a porous shell like that you know a, a clean egg um, is laid warm coming out of the hand and so as it contracts it, it will to suck in any of the environment of uh, pollutants uh, manure or you know barn dust or bacteria and viruses in through those pores as well. Um, I just took pictures of what you never want to see at a hatchery basically. Cause death to an embryo if it was a hatching egg or in this case here a table egg it, you know you have to be concerned about the salmonella and and stuff, and stuff. The flock I just got rid of like I said had a had a uh, bronchitis hit and my production was Last year in Manitoba, we had a disease outbreak and the egg pasteurizer, the breaker, was not able to ship to many Asian countries. So it does affect more than just your farm. It does affect the entire industry. So the, the costs do become very astronomical and problematic. C&D is paid for by the farmer. It's been estimated this is between fifty dollars and $100,000 per barn. The economic implications are sometimes hard to evaluate because you have a, a production drop and that's easily measurable, but then how well the flock recovers and the stress it's put on them for, for the rest of their lives uh, because they're working so hard day to day, you know, something that, that interrupts their cycle actually will have long reaching effects that, that, that may, they may never completely get over. You know, you look at condemns, so my condemns are up 2%. What does that relate to dollar-wise? I guess, how many birds are they shipping to market? Once all the birds have been removed, authorities will oversee the cleaning and disinfecting of the barns, vehicles, equipment, and tools to eliminate any infectious material that may still remain. So the biosecurity for us is anybody coming into our operation here, uh, yourselves included, it will, will produce a certain element of risk. So in terms of biosecurity, we like to start by not having anybody come um, except to the front door of the house. We don't want anybody driving in the yard or anybody using any of the barn lanes. Unfortunately, when you have disease or you have something, then they can really see the importance of it. And I, you hate to get it to go that far, but sometimes they need that awakening to say, oh wow, well, like, we did everything right and we still got it. I mean, to me, that's what, what biosecurity is, is finding a place where you keep whatever bacteria and, and, and viruses are inside that area inside, and anything that's not already inside, you keep it outside. Like if you have a chicken farmer, a broiler chicken farmer who happens to have some ducks, mm -hmm. does he realize the risk of the transmission between and the traffic between? Mm -hmm. um, maybe or maybe not. So it's a matter of being aware of making people aware of the risks they have that they haven't realized they do have. The poultry farm wants to keep out bacteria and viruses from other farms and the only easy way to do it is to have a good biosecurity program in place. Biosecurity is certainly a, a much bigger factor now. I know that's kind of the bigger focus that our company does but we also have to remember there's kind of three segments to biosecurity. It's not just cleaning and disinfecting, it's also rodents and insect. And if you don't control all three of them, you're not going to get very far. In order to clean a barn properly, you need tractors, you need brooms, uh, you need uh, backpack blowers, and you need washing equipment. So the day, the day after the birds go out, we come in with uh, the big backpack air blowers, and we blow off. And all, these barns are really, really dusty once a flock goes in. As soon as the birds uh, go to market, it is a good idea to uh, spray the lower walls where floor meets wall junction because darkling beetles and flies can be here. What I really find is getting rid of as much manure as possible before you even put water in the barn. You want to get right down to that cement, right down to that wood, because if we don't get rid of the biofilms, we, the, no disinfectant will work against the bacteria and viruses and spores. Once you've then rinsed everything off, give time for it to dry. With a clean barn, uh, we really look to see that the dust and the manure has been removed from the previous crop. 
only at the end of the flock will we'll come through here and we'll wash and clean that all off. Yeah. Particularly uh, dust and materials that might be left on exhaust fans, inlets, on feeders and drinkers. Um, they get that done and then typically they work on any heavy around the vents, anywhere that's a little bit, um, you want to get that down just to just start soaking. And the most important part is the floor. There's just so much water that accumulates on the floors. We purchased these Steiner squeegees, so we have two of them, and they just tag team and they start at the back and just push water out, which is pretty awesome. So washing and disinfecting a barn after the barn has been washed is the gold standard of cleaning a barn. And the better job that's done gives those birds a better start right from the get-go. There is a value in hiring cleaning companies to ensure that the barn is cleaned well. The experience of doing it over and over um, versus the motivation of the farmer himself to, to, to make sure he does a good job. I know it may cost into two or three thousand to do a good job, but... This is their business. This is what they do every day. And they also have a, quite a fair degree of knowledge so that it's done properly. And time is of the essence. And many poultry farmers are very busy, especially if they're crop farmers. And they don't always have the time or take the time to properly clean and disinfect their barn. In ensuring barns are dry, you, you run air through it. Run your heat for a few more days longer than you would. It's, a, it's money, but it just saves time and energy. And it's very important to have a minimum of 10 days between uh, crops. Now we're down to four weeks. Yeah. It's a tight turnaround. These flocks are not producing like the 308s were. And particularly between the time that the barn has been cleaned till the time that new birds come in. To have a little bit of downtime, a little bit of time to get into corners and clean them up, I think that's fine. Uh, if you're if you're the um, the pencil floor, or the bean counter in the organization, and you you're saying, well, that you know we can do it in three days, and you know, so let's do it in three days. Uh, for sure, you can do that. But sooner or later, I think you're going to be you know you're going to have those little things that you weren't doing catch up to you because you do get a natural die off of bacterial and viral organisms. Uh, with time. So we preheat to make to ensure um, any darkling beetles or, or any, any type of bug comes out and finds its happy place because it's warm again. They don't like it cold and wet. So we would get our fumigator to come on the Friday before. And it's got all weekend to sit. Monday morning we'll come in and air it out and, uh, and a lot of crunching bugs under your feet, which is a good thing. So if you don't do a good job, there's more challenge for those birds. And if they don't have much immune system, you're going to be challenged a lot quicker right away. The better job you do, the challenges may be down the road, and that's due to maybe issues from rodent population or insects or people traffic bringing the diseases in, what we call, say, the mobile vectors, you know, that you, you know, the farmer can control, and if he controls that, it makes the job better. I think uh, low budget items for a good biosecurity program would be uh, things like a gate, like your farm gate for, for your controlled access zone. Uh, signs up at the gate, signs up at the door. They're pretty good with that sign at the gate. Yeah. They usually always stop and call. And I got the number right there and the girls are, the girls are usually here. If it, and if it's after hours, they don't need to be here. A very simple lock on the door would also be a, a, a good part of a biosecurity program and always keep the, your doors locked. Alarm systems should also have a door contact, an intruder alarm system. We have an alert system and if, if you look over on beside the door and um, I guess it, it would be um, a laser that would go across the driveway so that when a, a vehicle comes in, a feed truck or um, a courier service, whatever it may be, then um, it makes contact with it and then there's a ding inside the office so that we know when someone's coming or going. Keeping in mind that the most common person to cross that barrier is the farmer himself. 
And so to have a specific set of clothes in the barn. Yeah. So the shoes and all that, we, we, we purchase our shoes. My shoes are dirty. We, we purchase our shoes and we leave them in the barn. Um, and uh, that, is, that, that is important for us. So like I said earlier, the bugs that are outside have to stay outside. What's inside, we like to keep inside as well. You're very likely to bring uh, an infectious agent onto your farm, on your clothing or on your boots. And so if you change your clothes and your boots and you enter your barn and don barn-specific clothes, you will reduce the risk tremendously of bringing disease onto your farm. The other point there is you're less likely to carry from your own barn to your house when you go to eat, etc., to carry any bacteria like salmonella uh, back to your house. We don't actually use the front door ourselves. When we come in from the barn, we use a separate entrance so that we're keeping all of that separate. The barn-specific clothes will allow you to separate what's in the barn and just leave it in the barn. And we have a line here that's sort of our line of separation, so we keep our clean stuff on that side and our, our dirty stuff on this side. So we do a complete change, and then when we come out, we leave everything here, so we're not tracking anything back anywhere. It's chicken catchers, tech, technical people from hatcheries, so if they are only here on a mission for birds, so blood work, anything like that, they don't have to go into my egg processing room. I'm trying to keep stuff, I mean, as separate as you possibly can. Even some of our supply people coming in, we have the, the shoes that are also important for, for them, the footwear. So rather than putting on rubber boots, it was easier and cheaper for us to um, buy the shoes that they are comfortable with and they stay on site. They have their own little area in there and there's not a lot of, we don't ever, we're not really out there very much, so there's not a lot of cross contamination. So having a, a complete set of changeable clothes for the operator, having a supply of protective coveralls and boots for any visitors, um, that's important. Uh, coveralls isn't hard, but have it easy. You have to have them available and I have it all the sizes there, so it's just a no-brainer. And the other things that get into people's barn that, that they don't, don't often think about are birds, um, you know, cats and dogs, the family pet. Stay. Good girl. But to have a baseball cap even for each barn that just keeps the dust on that hat in that barn rather than traveling in your hair. Do we use foot baths? Well, foot baths are good if you change it. They change this all the time. Um, the other barn always, it, uh, we, have to, we have to fill it up all the time. I mean, it's the little things. If it's easy, they'll do it. To me, the greatest risk coming in is the guys that are going to be transferring our pullets into this operation. Because the pullets aren't going to market, they're going to a new home. And then, uh, so when they handle those birds and they bring them into here, I have to know and have to have the security that they have looked at biosecurity in a very, very, very uh, uh, serious way. Uh, in one week, uh, they could do as many as 10 different farms. And of course, they're in there uh, catching chickens and they get exposed to all the infectious agents that might be on other farms. That's, uh, it's nice for chicken catchers because they, they'll just, they will go if they don't know any better, or they'll just not know where they're going and they'll just try to find a door. Just keep people out of the barn. Um, you know, if there's no reason for anybody to be in there, um, just don't encourage it. And that's an excellent part of a biosecurity program because you never know who might want to come in your barn. Newer extra bedding should be stored in a, in a secure building. So if it's straw, what type of rodent program are being done because big straw bales, round bales, big square bales are ideal nesting areas for rodents. And when I say secure, I like it to be in an area where, where you don't have rodents or any uh, dogs or cats going near this bedding. But you won't see them. As you come closer to pull that bale, they're scurrying because they have tunnels all through your bales. But you can harbor over 200 different diseases. You're now just spreading it throughout your whole barn. That nice, clean, washed, disinfected barn is now recontaminated to these day-old chicks that are going to go around and peck at the ground and being exposed to these bugs that shouldn't be there to begin with. Um, so I, we, we see the use of shavings a lot healthier to the birds because a lot less problems you know, with the quality of bedding compared to how straw can be stored. 
I think during your, your normal chores you would be checking bait stations, um, looking at tin casts to see if you're catching any mice. We have an outside um, company that does it for us. Yeah, you, you could have bait stations all around your barn, it looks great, but if you don't put poison in it, they're going to still go into your barn. If you're not commit to do it, you got to make sure it's getting done. They have everywhere, where, everywhere they have stations, everywhere. But if you do get an outside company that comes in, what's their protocol? Do they shower between farms? Are they wearing coveralls and plastic boots and that before they come onto your farm if they've been to another farm that day? But every now and then you're going to have a rodent that, that will beat the system and get inside the barn. He writes a whole, um, just where he sees activity, if he's changing the bait. Uh, in the winter we moved some of those boxes out there, so some of those boxes can sit in there for a little bit and that's, I moved some of them and sure enough there's, there's green uh, mouse turds. So number one, um, the bait's not working. Try something new every once in a while because you'll find that all of a sudden you might have a rodent infestation but all your, tr all your baits are full. So the idea is that if you mix them up, give them something new to try, you might actually uh, reintroduce the poison back into them and then remove that uh, population of rodents. Once mice get into a barn, they'll live in the barn for the rest of their life. They'll live up in the attics and in the walls and they come out and get their food. But, but rats live outside. They come in every night to get their food. And so if you do proper baiting, you put screens around all your inlet and exhaust fans so nothing can come in. Those holes would be large enough for a skunk to get in. You know, the size of your thumb is a hole a rat can get in. The size of your baby finger is what a mouse can get in. One of the things that you really look for is, is to follow good record keeping. Checking your birds, you get a good concept of whether you have a disease problem. And the easiest and best way to monitor that is walking through your flock. Walking through, seeing what they're like, are they moving away from you or some stumbling or some can't move? Why? I mean, look, look for reasons. You know, is there a problem? Is that water leaking so it's caused more problem? The litter's a lot damper. The ammonia level's too high because of things like that. So we keep quite a few records um, out here in the barn. We have a daily mortality record um, that we fill out every day. We record every day how much water has been consumed in um, each barn and also how much feed has been consumed. Um, this is our flock weight recording chart over here that goes with the scale in there. So every night we go to the uh, controller at the end of the, at the alleyway here. So right now birds are 4.321 kilos and that records all of the data. And write down what the, the daily weight is, how much they've gained, what the um, coefficient of variation and all of those things are so that we can go back and correlate any changes in feed and water consumption to weight changes. Water consumption is huge, so we do that first thing every every day. We put in a, a PWT product, which is there just to um, to uh, balance out the pH a little bit more. It, it allows the chlorine to to react better in our water system and uh, get rid of the biofilm in a sense in our in our water lines. And we have lots and lots of miles of nipples in these barns, and uh, so every day we come here, we have to make sure they have feed and water and and, uh, and good air. You want to know exactly where they came from. You know, feed trucks, uh, bird trucks, and they wash their truck every time. Every every time the, the loads are done, I think they just get out with a backpack sprayer. Every time I've seen them do it. Uh, I'm also thinking about uh, sweeping the floor. Like it's a good idea to keep it clean. Some people have fly monitoring programs where they they have different strips and and different cards that they can keep track of the, the level of, of insect um, activity. All of these daily maintenance activities are very important as part of the pest control program. If there's disease, we want to find it soon. In my experience, typically you're looking at three months from the day the disease is found till the day the barn is allowed to be restocked. Actually, when we go to spread it, I ask our the guy that spreads it, and he said, "No, I never see, I never see any well, shells or anything." Yeah, well, that, yeah, that, that's not the issue. It's the it's the odor. Yeah. But if you compost properly, there's no issue. There's right? no, yeah. I'm also fairly confident that our, our fly issue is going to uh, going to go away once uh, once we get things properly uh, done here. Last week we just 
ordered a composter. We, we've approved uh, a number of those units for, on the biosecurity program. Yeah, exactly. So. Just the fact that we haven't got any smell from all those uh, birds close. rotting away it tells me that it's uh, almost working. Yeah. So. It's kind of like a really thick stew and then as soon as you start having some more water to it and it starts to thin out and, and it's no different under rain or outside if you store it. Getting it incorporated into the soil is the right thing to do. I mean, one critical thing is the further away the manure pile can be from the barn eliminates rats, mice and insects of reinfesting the barn. So if your pile is just outside the door and the darkling beetle cycles 20 days when it's 25 degrees Celsius, in 20 days all those beetles are now moving back into your barn. Um, you need to, to be aware of, of any water runoff to make sure that it, it, it's not uh, going to drain you know, outside of the manure storage area. Most manure storage areas you want to have good airflow to, to help dry it, so there would be a lot of screens, but just leave it open to the air. When it goes to a pile down the road onto some concrete pad with retaining walls, it's handled properly. I think uh, building, building a cement half wall and then going up from there with, with something that'll keep the pests out will be, you know, is, is the right way to do it or a good start to it. So this last 125 feet here uh, offered us uh, an inside uh, manure area so we don't have to worry about wind and rain and ice and snow and stuff like that getting on our equipment. It runs more tickety-boo for us. Yeah. But if you had to build it from, from new, that would be a cost. I am going to put a, a, a roof over the manure facility. It prevents the manure from becoming wet. Wet manure attracts flies, and flies can carry bacteria like Salmonella, Campylobacter, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a good idea when you take your manure off the farm to spread it on the land. You also have a reduced odor from dry manure, so it keeps a very dry manure system. And bacteria love moisture, and the drier you have it, the less bacteria and the less flies. We've had the opportunity here to make up a trailer here to address the biosecurity issue on manure coming out from the end of our elevators and actually being airborne. So our, our original dump trailer that uh, we had obviously did not contain the, the manure like it should and it just gets spread across the, the land and into the air and, and possibilities of uh, contaminating every other areas on the, on the existing farm. So this particular trailer we uh, designed has higher sides on it with a roof on it. It contains it very well and uh, keeps, we address the biosecurity issue on manure being airborne and uh, possibly contaminating other areas on the farm as well as off the farm. Well, we've learned a lot in the last uh, decade or so. We have to take it seriously from, from, from not my generation, but my, my grandson's generation. It's kind of like everything else. If you don't make it workable, your staff won't use it. There's always room for improvement, but again, it's one of those things yeah, you've always done it that way. So you're changing the wheel, and, and sometimes that's hard to instill. These are things that are going to be um, issues we're going to be judged by. How, 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 how studious we were and, and how diligent we were to the attention to detail and how we farm today.